We are currently living in a world where it's so popular to be busy all the time that the really gentle or the quiet moments aren't as readily appreciated. And I think something that I'm just striving for to create more balance is maybe not to work through or work during my cup of coffee, but to read while I'm drinking my cup of coffee and then jump into my work and know that if that means I'm working 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later into the night, that that's usually the time that I can spare. Welcome to the Stokecast, where each week we bring you an inspiring athlete, adventurer, or entrepreneur and dig into their stories and strategies for balancing work, life, and adventure while having fun and making a difference. I'm Jonathan Ronzio. And I'm Emily Holland. Thanks for joining us today. Let's get to it. That was Becca Skinner. Uh, Becca is a Montana-based photographer, writer, conservationist, farmer, uh, just... All the things. All the things, all right? The things. She, she's fantastic. Um, and Becca actually was was introduced to us by a past guest. Who was Chris that? Chris Hampton, episode six, one of my favorite interviews. And now, why was that one of your favorite interviews? Because he's so thoughtful in his responses and he got me stoked to go climbing and i've seen him a couple times since and he's always been so gracious and awesome yeah chris is just a really <laughs> genuine great <laughs> guy and i mean he's a podcast host himself so he's yeah. like used to this medium and this right. format so the, the flow was on yeah but uh he's but so it. was it with this episode with becca as soon as we found out ab- about becca like we kind of checked out her channels and followed along for a while before we actually uh you know reached out for the interview yep and and her, her work is just incredible. Some of the yeah. best lifestyle photography that I've seen out there. And I'm fresh off of a trip, my first trip to Montana this summer. Yeah. Just in love with the place. And you so, are psyched on it. Yeah. At, and as you should be. I'm seeing yeah. all of her photos and it's just like making me want to go back. And everybody <laughs> should go to Montana. When are you going to go? Uh, okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any plans right now, but I'm hoping in the next year. That's a big question mark, but I hope to be there soon. Awesome. Well, so, yeah, Be- Becca is actually from Colorado or yeah. Wyoming. Yeah. Well, she, she's I forget. In she, I mean, she's been, she has lived in Wyoming or Colorado. <laughs> she's from the Rockies. And just like, basically, we, we talk about her story, uh, you know, through school to eventually winning a National Geographic Young Explorer grant. And mm-hmm. she went out to photograph um, Sumatra, Indonesia after the tsunami or, or a yeah. few years after the tsunami to compare it with pictures from the tsunami and kind of do this this uh, project that profiled the recovery and, and the, you know, the what difference in time, after, right? Yeah, a natural disaster. And yeah. she, that wasn't the first, or maybe it was the first. Uh, it was the first, and, and then she did some after that. Um, so it wasn't the only. Yeah, it wasn't the good that's words. What I, that's what I was looking words for. Words are hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but and in, in since then, of course, like that is still something she's passionate about and capturing those moments. Um, and now she's added landscapes, um, portraits, um, animals, all that good stuff. All the Montana and West lifestyle that you want to look at because it's also pretty. (laughs) Right. And I mean, she talks about her journey to self-employment of like kind of walking away from everything to live in the car and travel around, crush a whole bunch of miles and (laughs) uh, build up her uh, photography portfolio and yeah, she's she's eventually, uh, as of you know, recently, right, settled yeah. into Bozeman, Montana, or just outside mm-hmm. of Bozeman, with a nice big, as she called it, a food forest. <laughs> she lives on a permaculture farm. Yeah. Yes, I think that's correct terminology. And she tells us a little bit about that. If you're not familiar with what that is, as I was not, it's okay. But you'll learn a little bit about that this episode and what a food forest is. And how um, she basically came into her own as a photographer and as a fully self-employed person. Yeah, cool, cool episode. So uh, we we won't take up any more of your time. <laughs> I know we've had some long intros recently, so we're gonna keep this one short, and we'll do some some bigger updates at the end. So stay tuned. Jonathan's gonna drop a big nugget. You're gonna love it. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of sounds weird. <laughs> okay, Jonathan's gonna drop a big life update. A life, okay. life bomb? A life nugget. <laughs> just going to drop a nugget. Okay, so just keep listening. You're going to love it. <laughs> All right. Here's Becca Skinner. Enjoy.
Hey, Becca. How's it going? Hey, guys. Doing well. How about you? It's so good to have you on the Stokecast. We're stoked on it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're doing great over here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. So we want to hear all about your photography and how you got into that. Um, but maybe just right off the bat, I know you're you're living in Montana. So where are you living and, and what kind of land are you living right now? Sure. So I live outside of Bozeman, Montana. It's kind of a rural neighborhood outside of the city, if you can call Bozeman a city. <laughs> and we... My fiance Eduardo and I have about three acres and almost a full acre of that is a permaculture garden slash food forest. So everything in there is edible and we have 20 chickens and beehives and it is just a really awesome plot of land. God, I love the, the term food forest. That's just like, <laughs> I want to be in that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, me too. Me too. Um, awesome. Well, so for listeners who don't know uh, what permaculture is, um, no, I, I actually was able to do some volunteering in Honduras at a permaculture farm and in, in a couple other places in Central America. And it's a really cool concept. I was blown away, but I'll let you actually explain it because you have the hands-on experience right now. Well, I would be excited to get any info that you can chip in too since This is my first year taking over our specific food forest and permaculture plot. But um, how I understand permaculture is it is a garden space that's intended to mimic what's happening out in nature. So um, we it's a no spray. You pull weeds by hand. There are specific plants and vegetables and trees and shrubs that are planted next to other things to help fix nitrogen, um, to put out nitrogen and just better your soil and your land and create a whole new ecosystem. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's pretty spot on. I, I think the, the key to it is uh, ecosystem, right? And so that's what I learned when I was volunteering with doing like getting my hands in the dirt with the permaculture is like there were ducks in a little pool in a pond that the pond was actually what they were feeding through the hoses. So like the ducks are, are literally crapping in this water and that water is being used to fertilize uh, the herbs being grown in the garden. And then like mushroom scraps are turned back into like, it kind of was just this whole cyclical thing of using every piece of everything to benefit and support each other in a perpetual ecosystem. Yeah, that is exactly it. It, There are three of us that live in this house. And between the three of us, the majority of the food scraps go to the chickens, which that compost gets heated up. I mean, there's so little waste and we can absolutely be be doing better with that. But it's a pretty sustainable, um, I guess, rotation to live that closely to the land. It's really awesome. I've really loved and enjoyed digging into it. So what inspired you to, uh, to really dive into permaculture and, and, you know, start your food forest there? <laughs> yeah. So Ed, my fiance, Eduardo had, uh, basically had this plot designed by a really talented permaculture designer. Her name's Jessica Souza. And she spent five years working on the soil at our house. Cause it's It is an old riverbed, and so there's nowhere on the property other than this food forest where you can stick a shovel into the ground and have it go more than a few inches without hitting a rock. And so she spent years, she buried cottonwood mounds, and um, I mean, really, it was a full-time job. Last year was her last year with us as, as a designer, and I had moved in just a few years prior and was taking up an interest in it. And so out of the two of us, I had the more flexible schedule and kind of an interest in moving into farming or focusing on that more. So I took it over and it is, holy smokes, I have so much appreciation for people who work outside in the land every single day because it is hard work. 
Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but I imagine pretty rewarding to actually do work with your hands um, because as a photographer, I'm sure you have a lot of screen time as well um, that you have to do and focus on. You use your hands on the laptop I and on the know. camera. Oh, <laughs> and you get arthritis. It's fine. <laughs> um, so I imagine that's pretty rewarding and actually like the physical thing of putting your hands in the dirt, coming up with 30 30 hands at the end of the day. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I realized that I get really burnt out on photo work if that's the only creative thing that I'm doing. So it was a really nice step back for me to just create a little bit more balance and look at what what other creative things need to fill my cup so that I can be a better photographer. Um, and that this year for me was putting my hands on the earth every day. Isn't that cool? It's like to be a better photographer, it's not like you need to just do 150% photography. <laughs> like you need other things to give yourself that, that mental break and, and allow yourself to kind of approach photography with, with new inspiration. Yeah, that is exactly right. It's taken me a long time to realize that I am no good if I work myself to the bone and pull all nighters and just go, go, go. I'm, I'm 10 times better if I take a step back from it. So how long had you been going after the, uh, you know, the go, go, go professional photography career? Well, this is my fifth year owning my, my photography business and being freelance. And I think it just really depends on the season when it's go, go, go. And right now I'm in that season. And so I think, yeah, for, for about five years, but it goes on and off and it's in waves. And the biggest fallacy I had about self-employment before I was self-employed was that every year looked exactly the same. And so to, to have kind of breaks in between or have seasons where it is a go, go, go. I think working on stepping back or pushing it, learning when those things are coming up is, is better um, or makes me better and makes it a little bit easier when I can gauge, but that's not always the case. <laughs> so what was the process in um, becoming your own boss and, and having your own business versus, you know, working for someone else or, um, I know you went to school for for social work, right? So, what was the path from from that to then having your own photography business? I said photography is so weird, right there. <laughs> 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 photography. <laughs> um, it was a long process. I I would like to think that I just left school and was automatically hired, and that was just not the case at all. And I straddled other part-time work. I worked at a bakery for almost three years and shot photos on the side to try and figure out, do I actually want to do this full-time? And I had gone to school for social work and grant writing. And I had gotten a few photo jobs that encouraged me to travel. And I moved up to Montana and... A few years into doing the part-time here, part-time there, I realized that I, it was at the, the best time in my life where I had, I was paying low rent and I had the gear and I had enough savings to invest in a few more pieces of gear. And so I took a little chunk of my savings and started to just self-fund trips to create photo content to then try and sell to people later. And that ended up funding a few of my first actual jobs. That's awesome. Years later. Oh, well that, that's yeah. a, uh, a really important step. And, and like a few episodes back, we talked with Chris Burkhardt about that as well. Like how, I mean, to get started, so many people have this misconception that they like, they go after pitching and pitching and pitching, trying to get a brand to bite on an idea where it's like, really, if you want to get going, like, invest in it, put in, put in the money, put in the time and go, go get those images, that content that you can sell later, build that portfolio and and show that you can do it before you pitch it. Right. And I think it's such an important thing to, for photographers who are just starting out or any creatives that want to be working for themselves, that it's okay to not be full-time immediately. And it's okay to 
to straddle a part-time job and shoot on the side. And there's, there's nothing more glorious about being a full-time creative than a part-time creative. Yeah. And, and actually you, you called it out, uh, just a few minutes ago saying like you had this romantic ideal of, of going freelance and just like, you know, not knowing what was next and having life be this just impulse impromptu (laughs) adventure. But then like, once you have that for a little bit, then you start craving like, man, I need some rigidity in my schedule. I need to know what's coming up. I need a plan. Absolutely. The first few days that I quit my job at the bakery and decided I was going to be a photographer, I was like, okay, what do I do with all of my time? There's so much time in the day. And it was simultaneously so exciting and so overwhelming to just figure out how to be your own boss. And it's just comedic looking back on it. Cause now I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I had that kind of free time to, to pick and choose what I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, just starting out, you, you learn so much about, about being self-employed. So what were some of those like hard, hard lessons besides like, yeah, I need like an actual schedule to, to what the work that I'm doing. What were some of the things that you learned right off the bat about being self-employed? Well, I learned a lot about myself and just how driven I am when, when it's something that I actually want to do. And I didn't finish school when I left school, I just felt like, man, I, why am I not motivated? And this is an amazing opportunity. And I believe in education. And I think just a little boost of confidence in myself and thinking this is actually something I want to see happen. And it's exciting to see myself kind of graduate into this more driven, motivated person to go for my goals. And, and that was something really positive in that experience for me. So when you did make that transition to really like go for your goals, uh, post school, I I think I I read that you had clocked like 32,000 miles living out of your car, traveling the West and taking photos like, uh, in that time frame, how, how did people, uh, around you react? Like your parents, your friends that had seen you going on this, this, uh, this path, you know, you're studying social work and education. And, and like you said, you might've had a great opportunity and then you decided to just go live in the car and take photos. Like what what did people (laughs) think of that? Yeah. My parents were actually, I am so lucky. My parents were the ones that told me to stop going to school and yeah, I know I'm not, I am a rare case of that, but they just said it like we can see that you are struggling and it's okay if it is not the right time to be going to school. And we believe that we believe in you. And on the same token, they, they said, if you do that, then, you know, you need to get a job. And so I did, I worked part time for the state of Wyoming writing grants for mental health and saved up enough money to go travel and live out of my car for an extended amount of time. And I'm kind of lucky in the sense that there are quite a handful of my family members that have had unconventional jobs that are not nine to five. So it maybe wasn't such a shock to my parents or to my friends since I had a background in climbing and climbers always live living out of the back of their cars. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it didn't really feel that shocking to anyone, I think. And that was before the the hashtag van life. So I think you're kind of probably yes. like the traditional, you know, old school dirtbag, <laughs> dirtbag <laughs> climber the real, in, the, not, in the nicest sense of the word. Not, For a, those, not a sprinter van? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I was crammed in the back of a um, Toyota RAV4. And oh I am not a tall person, but even the back of that is not very big and I had to take the back seats out and I had to lay sideways and it was a junk show. (laughs) I had a RAV4 for my first vehicle, like when I was in high school. And yeah, that thing is, I imagine is probably a similar timeline. You didn't didn't live in that? (laughs) I didn't live in it. parents didn't make you live in that Although I would live in my Subaru now. I would definitely do that. (laughs) And it is definitely not tall enough for me. (laughs) So Yeah, Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask uh, if you had any uh, top of mind, like, 
car camping, tr- like living out of your car hacks or tips <laughs> for uh, for anybody hitting the road. I know actually on Instagram, some of our listeners have been tagging us, and and one guy just hit the uh, the road in a Kia Sportage and is and is just going for it. <laughs> Such a small vehicle. <laughs> I know, right? Um. Let's see. I think just safety wise, there was a lot of stuff that I, because I was a single female, I had my dog with me and that made me feel 10 times better about just camping solo. Um, but I have a super active imagination. And so there were a few things that I just had ready to grab if need be. And those were just to keep my keys right next to a can of bear spray And then when I moved and graduated to a truck and living out of the back of a truck, I had, (laughs) I couldn't lock the topper from the inside. So I bought two vice grips to put on the little T grips of the topper so that if anyone tried to get in, I would hear it first. But um, other than that, I think like, I don't know, there's always great places to shower at truck stops and and ymcas and um you can really go a long way if you're if you're pretty tough and just get a good cooking setup too. um get a good stove that's easy to use and not a pain to pull out it's, it's funny how you don't like a, you don't know those nuances of like the difficulties until you actually get in and, and realize like that you can't open that thing like when uh <laughs> In this past winter, I, I had a built a uh, bed in the back of my Grand Cherokee, and my wife and I were back there, and it was like the first night on the road, and we like shut all the doors, and then I realized that like the door the car was locked, and the bed that I had built in, like the the door handle couldn't open from the inside because it was blocked by the the like platform bed. <laughs> so like I was like, oh my god, we're locked in the car now. There's no way to open a door. <laughs> It was, uh, and then I had to just climb around all the gear in the front seat. But it's it's funny living on the road is an interesting thing. <laughs> Comedic, yes, I love that. I love that. <laughs> so just to be clear, though, you were with your dog and you in the Rev Four, so it wasn't even just you. It was like you and the dog. That's amazing as a oh, junk yeah. show. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. And I I didn't have very many possessions, but all of the possessions that I did have were there too so yeah just not not super comfortable sleeping but i made it work <laughs> so where where was the best place that you parked for the night and the worst oh man the best was probably big sur just being on that coastline is so special um and then the worst uh, i had a scary experience in the san bernardino national forest and just people that were partying and messed with my car in the middle of the night, which of course is terrible. Yeah. So that's the only time that I got up and had to drive away in the middle of the night. Cause I was just worried about safety or I'm sure there are some beautiful places in that national forest. And I did not find that place. Wow. Yeah. Worst, yeah. Worst spot I ever camped for sure. Man, there's, yeah, that's, it's unnerving. I mean, it's always unnerving camping, especially by yourself and like hearing those noises outside and thinking like, is that a bear? Is that a coyote? Whatever. And like, just, you know, or a human. Yeah. And just like staying in your tent. But I feel like in the car, even though you have the ability to have that like quicker getaway, there's something, I think even more vulnerable about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, after that, I started, uh, just sleeping under streetlights in in cities because I just didn't want to risk being out. Yeah, I, I think my risk factor went down a little bit after that. And and then shortly after that, my RAV4 just broke down completely. So maybe that was the worst place I ever slept was like when my transmission blew and I knew that it was the end of my car and my trip. Um, and that was in Truckee going up the pass. All right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Great place for a transmission <laughs> to break down. I heard s- some people broke down there a while back. I think their name were the the Donners, right? The Donner Party. Don't right. say that. <laughs> no, no. When I told my parents where where it happened, they were like, "Wow, that's okay. Get to town." And <laughs> you know, 
hitchhiking in the middle of the night. Good. Um, yeah. Well, the van life or car life aside, um, so you, you spent, you know, 32,000 miles on the road after school and decided to, you know, build out your photography um, portfolio. And and then, um, then I think, I'm trying to get the timeline right here, but then it is the Nat Geo Explorer grant, right, that happened for the tsunami in Indo- Indonesia? That happened while I was in school, and that, that oh, ended okay. up leading to me taking some time off because that was such a great opportunity at a young age. I think that really directed me towards my interest in pursuing photography full time. So can, can you tell us a little bit about the, the Young Explorer grant that you got with Nat Geo and like the whole, you know, the purpose of the trip? And and also I'd imagine, I mean, were you already studying grant writing at the time? Because it seems like that was, uh, you know, you had a, a level up on, on anybody else going for a grant. <laughs> yeah, sure. So the, the Young Explorers program is now called the Early Career Grant, but it's a grant program through National Geographic that at the time was intended for people 18 to 25 to have their first field experience with National Geographic. And um, you design a project and you write a grant for it. So you write the whole budget and the whole summary. And it was a pretty entailed process and competitive. And I applied once and just didn't make it in. And as soon as you get denied, you you can apply for the grant as many times as you want. And because I had been denied, I I started an application the day after. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I just, I wanted that experience with National Geographic. So I ended up meeting at a grant workshop through National Geographic. I met a photographer whose name is James Baylog, and he... He was the subject of um, Chasing Ice, and he does a lot of receding iceberg photography, a lot of work around climate change. And he had told me at this dinner, we were sitting next to each other, I told him about a project I had done on Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and how they were rebuilding or not rebuilding and how staggering it was to me about a place that just the resiliency that comes with a natural disaster and community efforts and how it's really important to be looking at places on how they rebuild or don't rebuild. And that is oftentimes the success or the demise of the place is that resiliency or lack thereof. So he mentioned that he had been to Indonesia and Sumatra after the tsunami in 2000 and four and they photographed all of these architectural artifacts in the middle of rice paddies these big mosque tops and how buildings had just completely shifted and he said I wonder what it looks like now and we both kind of turned and looked at each other and said oh that's the project so I I ended up writing a grant with a friend of mine Chris Michael to go to Indonesia to photograph the the province of Banda Aceh and how it had changed or had not changed since James had been there um, immediately following the tsunami. It was really amazing. It was like a big scavenger hunt. We took his images and just tried to create them exactly to to show how much it had changed and it was actually pretty challenging to find a lot of the places because they had grown and recovered so much. Wow. So you found that that they actually did rebuild in that time and and most of them had recovered pretty well? Yeah. The amount of aid work that had come in after the tsunami was pretty staggering. And there were all of these homes from the Red Cross that were built. And I mean, you could just see you could see how much they had rebuilt and it was really hard pressed to find a building that was still run down or um, had articles of clothing still left in it because they had done such a good job and they have a lot of pride in how their spaces look. And it's also a very religious province. They're 99.9% um, Muslim. And so religion played a really big role in that too in just helping out your neighbor, 
and community efforts and everyone piling in to to help each other. That's amazing. So you shot in, you know, New Orleans post Katrina and uh, and then this project in Indonesia. Like, is this something that's carried forward in your life is going to, um, you know, natural disaster devastation zones uh, or, or is there another way that like this aspect of, of social work and conservation has kind of, you know, cul- culminated yeah, throughout, throughout your, the rest of your career? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I, I'm definitely still interested in post-natural disaster communities, but I think more so for me as I'm getting more into farming or food I have an interest in the, the future of food systems and how ranchers are utilizing their land to be long-term sustainable or how they're grazing their cattle to be the best um, for the land and, and for their business. And so it's kind of shifted in this direction of maybe not natural disaster, but maybe preventing future dust bowls, um, which I would call a natural disaster. So, um, it's, yeah, it's shifted in that way. That's cool. I I mean, some of your photography, like the, the message that you're talking about permeates through it. And, and I have to say you have like some of the most beautiful outdoor (laughs) lifestyle shots of just like candid happiness in the outdoors with (laughs) dogs and with the horses and everything. Um, thanks. It's very, I mean, I I know I was pandering about the beauty uh, of Montana before we hit record, I think, but like, I'm going to say it again. Damn, (laughs) Montana (laughs) is amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad canvas to be working in at all, but thank you. So I'd I'd love to know a little bit about your photography process and like, you know, how, how you think about image composition or... Uh, post-processing or like what what goes into capturing a moment for you yeah oh man I think that I'm really inspired by light and every photographer loves the golden hour in the morning and at night I I think um there's that section of time during the day that I'm like, Oh my gosh, my brain is just exploding because I'm in light panic mode and I have to capture it because I know that it's fleeting and I think maybe more than that specific light, all of those fleeting moments, like people just taking a moment to enjoy their surroundings or people in landscapes, um, knowing that that, that moment is captured, uh, well, when, when the moment is fleeting, I think, um, I think about that a lot. I I don't know. I'm really inspired by light, light and new landscapes, mountains and wide open spaces and places that really shift your paradigm from thinking um, that that we're more than just a speck. <laughs> more than just like that's hopeful. I like that. <laughs> more than just a speck of dust on this uh, this planet. <laughs> I I love it because I can get so wrapped up in just my own issues or problems. And, and anytime I can think like, man, I'm pretty darn small here. It always makes me feel a little bit better, but I also, (laughs) I hear the way I said that and, and I didn't mean it to come out like just a speck of dust. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I think that's that's great. It's a good perspective to have, um, that, you know, like these little tiny things that we worry about throughout the week or, you know, every month are, in the grand scheme of things, like just relax, you know, it's, it's not going to make or break the planet. Um, the, the little worries that we have. So no, but I think that's good perspective to have. And, um, I'm just, it's kind of funny, the spec. <laughs> Can you think about that? <laughs> oh, um, so when you were but, getting, Oh, sorry, no, go for it. No, I was, I was just thinking about post-processing and that is such a hard question to answer. Cause I, it's all been self-taught. And so I feel like so much of my learning, I'm not totally sure that it's the right thing to be doing, but that's just the way that I taught myself. So that's the way that it goes. Um, and it's always really nice to get together with other photographers to see their post process or the way that they work. 
um, because everyone works so differently. Well, so when you were first just getting started as a photographer and, and, you know, you pick up a camera and you're traveling and you're inspired by these landscapes enough to want to invest in the gear to capture it better and do justice to that image and share it with people to inspire or motivate or whatever the purpose be, what were some of the things that that kind of helped you level up your your images? Yeah, you know, it sounds simple, but because I had a dog, I was taking my dog for a walk every day. And so that's naturally when I would take my camera out and practice shooting. So as she's running around a field in Laramie, Wyoming, and it's a blizzard outside, I would shoot almost every single day when I took her for a walk. And I think that just that consistent practice of shooting in different conditions or shooting in different light was so helpful for me just in the beginning and just to take a moment to look around and say, why do I like the way that fence looks? And I would take four photos and say, man, that really doesn't look how I want to portray it or how I actually see it. How can I do that better? And it was in those early days of just taking a walk every single day um, that I think I really grew leaps and bounds. I love that. I got to start bringing my camera like on my walks with my my little pup. That'll that'll force me to actually take photos. Kate is so photogenic. You have to. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Maybe I can have you come out, Becca, and you can take some photos of her. (laughs) Yeah. Walks and dogs. I'm in. Well, I love the the ranch style, too, of your photos. I mean, that's something that, at least from being from the Northeast, I mean, Jonathan and I are both, we, we live and are um, raised in the, in the Northeast primarily. Um, so, like, uh, the ranch life is just so out of our um, uh, comfort zone, or, like, I don't really know anything about it. So, in capturing you that... You're saying I'm not a rancher? <laughs> I'm saying that you're definitely not a rancher. <laughs> You don't have a permaculture farm, man. You can't be a rancher. Um, but no, I, it's just so like fun to see because it, 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 I don't know. It's just like so out of my like everyday life that it's it's just um, like pushes me out of my comfort zone a little bit to be like, oh, there's like there's this whole other beautiful section of the United States that I just don't know what the lifestyle is like there. Yeah. Well, thanks. It's I I can't imagine living anywhere anywhere else. I think being raised between Colorado and Wyoming and now living in Montana, there's just a deep love for the landscape here that I don't think I'll ever be able to shake. And I know that there are some beautiful spots on the East. And I was just in rural Missouri, which is not a place that I ever thought that I would be either, but (laughs) I was like, wow, they there's fog here and fog is like a novelty to me because we don't have that very much out here. So there are some really beautiful spots all over the, all over the country for sure. There is. It's a, it's worth exploring the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so for, for a lot of your photography or for a lot of your photos, at least on Instagram, you are in the pictures as well. So are you, are you doing a lot of self time shots or are you tra- like you with another photographer? Yeah, most the majority of them are self portraits and um, that came from just not having anyone else to photograph and I was out there on my own in a lot of the 32,000 miles and I wanted to capture it and I wanted a human in the landscape but oftentimes didn't have one that was outside of me. So um Either that or now being partnered up um, in a relationship, I'm with my fiance a lot and he occasionally takes the photos too, which is nice. It takes <laughs> far less time that way. <laughs> well, that's super cool. I mean, that's such a skill to develop. The like To take such uh, beautiful, candid shots that don't look like self-timed or remote posed or anything like that, um, that is a, a special skill. I say... A a one woman show photographer, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, I, sometimes I wish that I could just be a fly on the wall and watch myself do it because you run back and forth and you're like, Oh, that's not quite right. And if anyone watches me, it's like game over because it's so embarrassing. (laughs) (laughs) That would be such a fantastic documentary. 
Yeah, right. Just a short film of (laughs) self-shots. Maybe a silent black and white, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Like, kind of like jolty, slow, uh, fast motion. Uh Uh-huh. Wow, you guys are really painting the picture. This is great. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll storyboard this after the call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take this offline. Um, so we talked a little bit about the lesson learned from when you first became self-employed of like, wow, I, I don't know what to do with all my time. And now you're at the point where you're like, wow, I wish I had all this free time. But like, how did you figure out how to manage your time effectively and, and balance um, you know, your relationships with your, with your fiance, but also just with like friends and inner dog and other portions of your life. Oh man. There's some days that I win at that. And there are some days that I just totally don't. And because my fiance is self-employed too, we can really work ourselves into the ground. I think watching the other person work, you're like, Oh, he's working so hard. I'm going to work so hard. And he can operate really well on, on little sleep. And I think that's kind of where I take a back seat is when I, when I hear my body saying like, I need way more sleep than what you're giving me. Then I know that I've just been, I've been pushing myself a little bit too much, but I think waking up early, having a little bit of, of a routine um, is really helpful in that balance. And I am a big believer in to-do lists and it feels so great to cross things off of to-do lists. Even if it's two things seen aligned through something like, yeah, I completed that. That is usually really helpful for me in my breaking up of, of tasks during the day. Absolutely. I like literally, as you were saying that I was staring just to the right of my computer, there's a to-do list. And one of the items (laughs) is interview with Becca. And I know I can cross that off very soon. Well, (laughs) Good, good. I'm, I'm glad to be helping you with that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, well, do, do you use anything besides like pen and paper for your to-do list? Do you have a, a special, you know, system or app recommendation or, uh, you know, take us through that and also your morning routine if you have one? Yeah, sure. So because I'm a visual person, I found that just pen and paper is my best method of remembering things and taking notes and, um, making those to-do lists. And I just had to order a new moleskin notebook today because this is my like one and a half year on the last page book, um, which always feels fun to start that over. But um, this one book is where I keep everything. And then in the morning, I usually, I get up pretty early Um, in the summertime. That is a, a much earlier time than it is right now. Um, but in the summertime, it was great. I would wake up at six, I'd take a shower, I'd go work in the garden and make myself a good dark cup of coffee and a good breakfast. And usually that entailed eggs from the chickens that live 50 feet away from the front door and garden vegetables and then work in the garden for a few hours, take a lunch break, work in the garden again in the afternoon then I would try and tackle some emails when it was just the heat of the day and far too hot to be working outside. Um, And now it is mostly wake up, eat breakfast, and just do emails or plan the photo shoots. That's kind of my winter fall plan. Far less exciting. I like the summer breakfast. I'm, uh, can I can I come over for summer breakfast? <laughs> em- Absolutely. Emily says that I'm not a rancher, but I assure you, I, 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 can, <laughs> I can hold my own. <laughs> you can you can mold into a rancher if you so choose. I support you, dude. <laughs> in your endeavors. I love that. I love the the coffee in the morning is really like that is something that is such a simple pleasure to like sit down and enjoy your coffee but when you do it you feel like the most productive human being alive like I feel like you have that you see like the steam coming off of it which I've seen actually in a few of yours from your like jet boil yes. and um, you're like oh this is going to be a really good day when I have that little thing in front of me totally I yeah it's so funny that that thing is is the thing that can really catapult your day forward. And, oh, man, I I really depend on that cup of coffee in the morning. So I think the lessons, though, from, from the rituals that you have or the, the schedule for summer, though, is, well, even with the bringing your dog and, and taking photos, is like you can get outside 
every single day in small ways and it'll probably make your the rest of your day way more productive <laughs> so just those small moments where you can where you can go outside whether it be a walk for your dog or for for your case obviously you're you're actually working the land so that's a little bit more intense but anyone can do that and i think that that's something that we um shy away from a lot because it takes away from our time in front of our emails and stuff, but that is super, super important. Yeah. I, there was something that I heard a few years ago that I've really just carried with me, which was, um, stop the glorification of busyness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are currently living in a world where it's so popular to be busy all the time that, the really gentle or the quiet moments aren't as readily appreciated. And I think something that I'm just striving for to create more balance is maybe not to work through or work during my cup of coffee, but to read while I'm drinking my cup of coffee and then jump into my work and know that if that means I'm working 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later into the night, that that's usually the time that I can spare. But especially waking up and jumping right into email or screen time can be really challenging. And um, yeah, just to, to stop glorifying the busyness for me is, is a good goal for me. What a a good hack. I love that. Just don't work during coffee. Okay. New, new goal. (laughs) Well, the the afternoon or for me, the three other cups that I have though, you can work through those, but the morning one, (laughs) Just start the morning fresh, cup yeah. of coffee and a shot of nature. It's it's. Does it just me that when you buy a new like bag of coffee that you get excited? Is that just me? It's just you. It's not just me. No, no that is on board. No. <laughs> we, I have to say, we started roasting our own coffee beans this year, which is so fun and it's so easy. And I totally get that way when I have a little bit more ownership of like, I roasted that coffee and I can't wait to see how it tastes and how, how well or how horrible I did. Oh, I love that. So you're, you guys are really taking ownership over like most of the food products that you're putting into your bodies, but well, purchasing or not purchasing, I guess, depending on what you have. (laughs) Yeah. My, my fiance is a chef. So it, I would say our, our lives revolve a lot around just the food that, yeah, we're growing or eating or harvesting, whether it be through hunting or, or anything else. That's awesome. I mean, not enough people probably think about like where their food is coming from and um, what the process was in, in getting them the coffee beans that I just talked about. Um, so it's a good reminder, though, to, to think about that process, the supply chain, but then also like the animals behind it as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you hunt as well? I am just learning. I, right now I am a pretty good packer outer of meat and just a a good fly on the wall for a hunting trip, but I want to learn how to do it really well before I venture into it myself. When, now, when did you go on your first trip? Well, my family ran, my grandparents ran a, a hunting outfit in Wyoming. So I grew up just around that sort of hunting or elk camp um, in the fall time. So probably pretty young, but as an adult, I was vegetarian for years because I didn't feel like I had access to good meat or couldn't afford it. So I think when I started dating Eduardo is when I started to take more of an interest in, in hunting and being a part of my own meat supply chain too. So four years ago. So that that's so interesting because that is obviously a you know a polarizing thing in in the outdoor space. What like some people are very for uh, hunting, bow hunting, all of that, and some people are are very against it and are, are advocating for no animal meat and all. But like I like that you say you're you were vegetarian when you didn't have access to high quality meat, but now that you can like go on the range and you know, go, go through the process and get, get it yourself. And you know, the quality, you know, the story, uh, that's when you'll indulge. Yeah. Yeah. I am a strong believer in to each his own when it comes to food and people eat differently for different reasons. But for me, this has been the most, um, reasonable way for me to 
to eat meat again is to to be hunting my own meat or to be part of that process. So as a, uh, a conservationist, I know one of the, the biggest like misconceptions or challenges against hunting is like the obviously people don't want people killing animals. But uh, from a conservationist, I'd love to hear your perspective on like the good side of hunting and in, from that standpoint of like balancing ecosystems or whatever that you see uh, even in your backyard and the surrounding ranges. I'm still learning more about it. So I, I'll try and only say what I know. Um, but yeah, yeah, totally. What, I mean, whatever you know or want to talk about, that's fine. I'm, I'm just like interested in the topic. Yeah, totally. Um, I am too. And I think as a hunter, I, I recognize that hunting is a huge supporter of public land. And I know that that is such a hot topic right now, public land and public spaces and even private land. So the amount of money that hunters are paying to access those places I mean, getting an elk tag to hunt elk in Montana is not a cheap thing, and it is not cheaper to hunt your own meat than to buy it at the store. And so there's that piece of it. And then also there is a management that needs to happen in terms of animal population, and maybe hunting is not the perfect way to go about that. I'm still not sure, but I, I do believe that it needs to, populations need to be managed. Um so those are kind of the two big pieces for me that as I'm coming into the hunting world a little bit more, I'm recognizing that that keeps popping up in conversation. Yeah. And so these hunting groups are, are financially supporting a lot of the protections that we have on public lands um, in order to be able to hunt on them. I'm getting into territory that I don't know enough about, <laughs> but I do know I agree with what you're saying. Back <laughs> yeah, no, this is, this is yeah. certainly a, a conversation with a lot of points on a lot of sides. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we don't have to get too deep down this rabbit hole right now, but I certainly, it was the first time it had come up on the show and I, I kind of wanted to prod at it a little bit. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, and yeah, there are so many sides to it and it is not a black and white issue by any means. Totally. So I, I do want to ask when you started, you know, down your career and like you're getting into photography, you're studying, uh, how did you know that you wanted to combine adventure with conservation or with you know, any kind of philanthropy? Like what, what made you want to pursue the outdoors with a a more impactful purpose? I wish that it had come sooner, I think, but for me, it came after doing a few years of just straight commercial work where I'm telling people to buy things and having a little bit of this guilt in the back of my head, like, oh man, I am a visual storyteller and I have the capability to really change people's minds on why places should be protected or what exists in places. And I was feeling burnt out on commercial work and just wanted to start doing more to give back because photographers, creatives, anyone who who has a large social media following, I mean, just everyone is in the position to spread good information, whether it be word of mouth or otherwise. And I just felt like I wasn't doing that enough, especially with having a camera and kind of knowing how to use it. So just in the past few years, I've been more interested in in talking about more conservation stories. Yeah, I think it's super important. And, and honestly, I think that might speak to a lot of people that listen to this podcast in, in that, you know, people are always trying to find what will help them make a better impact in the world. And I think a lot of people have that same pang of guilt that you're talking about where it's, um, well, what am I actually like, what is my impact here? What, what is the way that I'm going to, even if it's like a legacy thing, like what am I going to leave behind when I leave? Um, and I think that so many people struggle with that. Um, and you just have to figure it out for yourself. What makes most sense to, to be able to leave a nice legacy or do more good for the world. Right. And I think the current threat to public lands has been so big as everyone in the outdoor industry feels we can all be doing better 
For sure. Um, but, I, you know, for, for me, I think the way that I, I approach it is, like, if somebody's going to look at, like, the long-term story or if they're going to scroll through, you know, my entire Instagram feed or if they're going to read every blog post or, like, look look at more of a, a longer vision of, like, my work and my story, I would like that to read in a positive, impactful manner with, like, more more of a, a thread of consciousness and giving back and, and, you know, social and environmental impact. But I don't think that every post needs to speak to that. I don't think everything mm-hmm. you do, every story needs to speak to that. I think like there's, there's a balance between like having that impact and also just having fun for yourself. But as long as the long, the, uh, long you know, the, the umbrella of it is uh, trending in the right direction and, and speaking the right story to, inspire others to, to live a positive, impactful life. I think that's the goal. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. You drive yourself nuts. If you, for every decision you'd make, you're like, well, but if, what about the ants that I'm <laughs> stepping on? Like, I yeah, can't, right. there's, I think there's like a religion actually that is, is about that. But anyways, um, yeah, I, I totally agree, Jonathan. I think there's certainly a delicate balance for sure. So Becca, we have a question that we ask all of our guests, and that is, what does Stoke mean to you? That's such a good question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we thought of it ourselves, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what does Stoke mean to me? I think for me personally, it means just living like you're so fired up to to build a community, to make a change, to be friendly and and gentle and kind towards people. I feel like that at this current point in my life, that's what stoke means for me. So what are you most stoked about right now? I am so stoked about moving through the next few months with some big conservation projects in mind. And maybe talking about the future of food in a, in a larger capacity, but also just getting to know people on both sides of the equation and talking to some populations that I maybe don't interact with on a normal basis. And yeah, just talking a little bit more about conservation. That's awesome. And go ahead, Jonathan, you have a question. I, no, no, it's, I was just going to say very cool. <laughs> I was going to see if you wanted to elaborate on any of the uh, upcoming conservation projects, but you, you know, you can tease us or, or not. Yeah. I, um, I'm interested. Well, I hinted at it a little bit earlier, but I'm really interested in talking about sustainable ranching right now and how, how farmers are utilizing their land to, um, give it, they hand it down through generations and just leave it a little bit better than they found it. Love that. So we can continue following along on, on those stories. Is Instagram the best place for people to, to follow along your, your story? Yeah, you can be following along on Instagram at Becca Skinner, and that is the best place to find me. Awesome. And we'll have that in the show notes as well. Great. I'm very excited to see how your, your story evolves. And uh, I mean, it's, it's been inspiring and uh, beautiful thus far, so I'm expecting some amazing things from your corner <laughs> as, as we explore the sustainable ranching model. And I, I would take you up on a breakfast sometime. <laughs> yeah, for a both. <laughs> some, some fresh eggs and coffee. A- anytime, guys, anytime. Well, thanks so much, Becca. It's been awesome chatting with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me, guys. So the really cool thing about our interview with Becca was that after we stopped recording, she was basically like, um, so what's going on with you guys? What are you stoked about? What do the next couple months look like? What are, like what's going on in your life? And she that was the so, interview tables. Yeah, I was like, whoa, <laughs> excuse me. Well, <laughs> um, usually that's at amazing. The, at the end of an interview, usually, well, at the beginning of an interview, yeah. we're, we're always like, so at the what's end, up? we'll say goodbye yeah. and then we'll kind of have an awkward pause and we'll still be here. So don't hang up because yeah. then we'll kind of just do a little like casual <laughs> off recording ender. So yeah. for anybody who doesn't know, that's, that's how it's done. Yeah, that's how we there, do it. But yeah. but sometimes, uh, you know that that final conversation doesn't happen because like you just you yeah. go through an hour long chat and then you totally forget and yeah. then we like go through the all right well great thanks for for talking <laughs> with us goodbye yeah. 
and then and the, like, the goodbye Hello? really turns into goodbye. Are you still there? <laughs> right. But yeah, Be- Becca hung out with us for like another half hour just chatting and wanting to know, uh, you know, about us and our stories yeah. and what we were stoked about. It was awesome. I said some really uninteresting things, so I'll keep that off. <laughs> I just said that I was nestling into Boston and wanting to spend more time here. And, but that's not really that interesting. So we'll move on to the more interesting No, no, thing. no, no, no. Hold on. <laughs> What? How, how has the nestling been going? Nestling is one of the best words. And why? So, you, I mean, you said so, that you were like so busy on the go. Yeah. I literally had to like schedule every single moment and like including um, spending time with my sister, who I live with, and spending time with my boyfriend, who I spend a lot of time with. Um, so it was getting like really exhausting. And so I've had a couple weekends and I have a couple more the rest of this year where I'll be in Boston. I don't have anywhere to be. I just have like, you know, a couple things at night or like little parties to go to here and there. But um, I'm really just like, there's a lot of books on my nightstand and I'm just like ready to take those on. You've committed <laughs> committed to the nestle. Yeah, I'm in the nestle. I, I love the nestle. And this time of year is great for that. You know, we eat a lot of soup. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that's a really, it's, so weird, but it's a good transition. It's necessary. It's necessary. Yes. That's a really hard thing to do sometimes. I feel like, I feel like I'm booked and committed through like 2020. So like, well, w- one, one of the, one of the things <laughs> that I have like lived by for a while, it was like my, the thing that I clutched to, to keep me traveling more, having more adventures. And it was that I would never return from a trip without having another trip already booked and planned. Yes. And and that was amazing for the, you know, when I started doing that. Yeah. But then very quickly it became like, you know, a year and a half was already booked. Yeah. As I got busier. It gets, and, it's like a snowball effect. Yeah. You're like, well, I could, well, what I get here this weekend? Oh, I'm free that weekend. And then you're just like, am I ever home? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. so I've, I've actually had to commit a little bit recent. Like I'm still traveling and still busy, but I've had to commit a little bit more time to just scheduling time to be at home yep. for the weekend like dates. like this past weekend yep. i my wife and i did nothing except like pack and oh. spackle the walls and paint and yeah so this is what oh, this is what emily's been really trying to this what emily's been trying to pull out but the, the nugget <laughs> the life bomb is is that my wife and i bought a house <laughs> right woohoo <clears throat> Um, we, so that's we, good. <laughs> we, went, we went from literally exactly a year ago yep. today, we were packing up our, our whole apartment to put on Airbnb and had built a bed in the back of my Jeep. Yep. And the we, infamous road show. <laughs> <laughs> we were hitting the, the road just after Thanksgiving for a whole winter of like uh, on the road, traveling out west and basically living in as small of tight of quarters as possible with yep. our two dogs. And here uh, now, a year later, you made it totally opposite side of the coin. We're upgrading from from not not even van life, like back to the jeep life, life yeah. <laughs> to uh, to house life, which is just awesome. what is that? Okay, so tell us a little bit about it. I mean, what's it? What's well, your so most the, excited yeah, part? Uh, the barn, the barn for sure. Okay, so it's a farm. Bar- yeah, it's an old farm, which goes right along with Becca. Becca, if you're listening yeah. to this, still you, like. We're having a farm battle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming out for breakfast and then you come my way and, and once I once I get things up and running. Yeah. But no, it's it's like an early nineteen hundreds farmhouse in uh, in the Blue Hills area, which is Love just it. like twenty minutes south of Boston. Basically I, I kinda wanted to go a little more north towards the <laughs> towards the bigger mountains. Yes. Uh, but my wife's uh, job is like her coaching, you know, the the rink is actually moving south of Boston and both of our parents and families are south of Boston yeah. so that kind of made more sense and I was like all right the only way I'm going that way is if our backyard is the Blue Hills which is like 7,000 acres of just like amazing Trails. trail running yeah. mountain biking uh and so that's you know after a few months of looking we found a beautiful property which is it an is old beautiful. farmhouse and there's like a giant barn in the backyard that I'm going to convert into like a climbing stu- training space and a <laughs> production studio we'll have a better spot for the Stoke cast oh my gosh and maybe not dogs barking, maybe but not. that kind of adds character yeah. to it. So I like that. Yeah, I like that. The dogs are all right. They're cute. They're very um, cute. But no, it's it's like it's legit. I mean, this the barn used to be. I think in the twenties, it was like where they had like the the pony club for the town, and and oh like there's gosh. there's like legit like horse stalls and everything. So Damn. We, I got to figure out what to do with it. But we're like across the street from the trail entrances to the Blue Hills. That's so. And rad. like a mile from the little ski hill down the road. So wow. all winter, I can just like skin up. 
the uh, the slopes there, get some runs in, go back and That's work awesome. work on the the Stoke cast and <laughs> and train you all and everything else in my world. Love it. Yeah. That is a very big deal. I know, I know. I'm so, it's very exciting. So that's when, when Becca asked what what I was stoked about and what was happening in my future. That was You're the like, answer. Um, just bought a house. And <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> my second purchase. Wow. I can't even. Yeah. I didn't even buy a car. <laughs> I'm on the other end of that spectrum. But that's for another session, probably. You got to go van, uh, Jeep life first. Jeep life. What about Subaru life? Can I do that? Yeah. I think I can. I call it my bed brew right now. So yeah. I'll do it. Well, Either so you, way, you gotta let you gotta let go of the, the apartment and uh, and just and literally just, all of my belongings because nothing do, else fits in there besides the bed. Right, <laughs> and just do do what Becca did and just take Kata and Andrew yep. and hit the back of the Subaru. Yep. And then in a year you'll graduate to a house. Is that I think that's like the proven trajectory. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Uh, I'll let you know. We'll circle back. <laughs> we'll circle back on that. Well, thanks for listening to us, guys. We always appreciate all of your support. And Jonathan's psyched. I'm psyched for Jonathan and his wife and puppies. Puppies. Yeah. And, so um, fo- follow uh, along. I mean, if you just check yeah. me out at Jonathan Ronzio, you'll see some of the behind the scenes of the move and check out, uh, you know, the, the barn and, and the whole place <laughs> as we get down there. It's happening in, in just these next couple weeks. How much do you think the house is haunted? I don't know. I, I have yet to explore 1920s? the... 1920s? There's probably no, some, it was, like... No, it, uh, it was built in, I think, 1875. Okay. So then, mm, there's probably some ruckus ghosts in there. Maybe. I'm excited to yeah. do a study on that I of mean, your house. <laughs> I mean, at night, it's uh, the barn is not going to be, like, my most exciting place to go until oh, there's, no, no. Until there's some there. lights. No, no. Yeah. Just don't go in there. <laughs> Just don't, <laughs> like don't cross the driveway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, right. thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks, thanks for listening to, to the update of my life. I appreciate it. And I'll be busy nestling. You can follow me if you want to see what books I'm reading or whatever, but it's at E underscore Halls. There you me. go. And of course, at the Stokecast and go yes. to the Stokecast.com for uh, all the episodes in the past, uh, including Becca's here with all of her show notes. You'll find that right there. And uh, And as always, we really appreciate you guys. Uh, listening and please continue sharing the stoke share the stoke there it is the ending staccato from emily share the stoke (laughs) (laughs) it's always a chant yeah (laughs) all right later thanks so much for tuning in i'm emily holland and i'm jonathan ronzio we'll catch you next week with another episode of the stoke cast 